Okay, so let's uh, let's take a look at the physics inside the ergosphere. Well, we'll look at that, and then we'll we'll do a we'll, we'll do a separate problem on uh, the great granddaughter of uh, of Newton in a spaceship uh, go, going around a, a, a Schwarz shield uh, uh, a black hole to uh, to again uh, show some of the physics of that of that environment. But we're going to do the environment of the rotating uh, black hole first, and the thing we were interested in is is uh, what happens to matter that, that passes into the ergosphere. So it goes through the uh, surface of infinite redshift and it goes into this region between uh, the, uh, infinite, the surface of infinite redshift and the event horizon. Okay, so it's a curious place to live because uh, GTT is less than zero. Okay, and so you're, what you would have thought was your time-like interval is now, is now space-like. Well, we know in a region where GTT is less than zero that the stationary, uh, stationary behavior in, in your uh, coordinate system is impossible, okay? And so let's look at the possibility of, uh, of a particle being inside the ergosphere but rotating, okay? And so that's what I, I've written here. I'm going to look at, at velocity four vectors of this form. Okay, so, so it has a, a, a u in the zero direction, that I call that ut, okay, and I, and, I, and I choose to pull that out, okay. And then omega, uh, here left behind, would be, would be d phi dt. Now, if I, if, I, if I left this in, so there was ut here, and also it was in this factor as well, then I know what this term is. This is just d phi d tau, where tau is the proper time, okay. But I pull ut out, ut is just basically the derivative of t with respect to the uh, proper time. I pull it out, and then I'm left behind with this one. And we've studied uh, d phi dt in our, in, in our, in for various rotating metrics already, okay? And so I think that's a good, that's a good variable for us to focus on, okay? And it tells us how rapidly the coordinate angle uh, changes with time. Okay, now what we want to do, okay, here is to, is to uh, remember that that u is a, is a, is a, a normalized uh, four vector. u dot u is equal to c squared. Of course, it's just the velocity, and I want to write that out in this coordinate system. So I have I have uh, the dot product, and I write out the dot product in terms of my metric. Okay, so so it brings in u t squared, u t u phi, and u phi squared. But now now I just I just make this definition of pulling ut out of the, okay, out of the uh, second term, out of the u phi term. So I've done that here. I pulled him out. I pulled him out twice. Okay, so I get a capital omega left behind here. I have to pull it out twice, so I get capital omega squared here. Okay, okay. And so uh, and so now this this is a generalization of the algebra we did, which showed us that a stationary object is impossible inside the. Uh, inside the surface of, it, of infinite uh, redshift in the Schwarz shield case, because in that case there was no, there was no uh, angular velocity. We were just looking for the possibility of a, of a particle uh, sitting at a fixed r, a fixed theta, and a fixed phi. So these terms were not there, right? And then, I, and then we see that if GTT was negative, that's an impossibility. So, okay, so uh, stationary motion is not, is not possible there. Okay, and that and that's sensible because inside inside that surface, uh, uh, space and time are in some sense interchanged, right? In the Schwarzschild case, you get inside the the surface of infinite redshift, which is also the event horizon, and you are relentlessly drawn to r equals zero. Okay, okay. So in this situation here is different. Okay, I have these two extra terms, and so uh, the stuff in parentheses has to be greater than zero for sure. And that gives me a, uh, a, uh, a condition on omega. Setting the inequality to zero, I get, I get two solutions for, for omega, okay? Okay, and I just, I just do my quadratic formula and I write it down. Here it is in terms of, of the g's. And then I recognize some familiar uh, faces here. I see minus g t phi, g phi phi. That's what we were calling smaller case omega, okay? That, we, that we've already that we've already identified and gotten okay and gotten uh, and gotten used to okay okay and then uh, okay.
Okay. And then in the second term, I have omega squared, and then I have a term, a term here. Okay. So let's look at it. Let's look at it as as we move from the from the surface of infinite redshift down toward the event horizon, the first event horizon. Notice that on a surface of infinite redshift, when we just pass through, we see that GTT is equal to zero, and then in that case, omega plus. You see, if this isn't there, I get two solutions. One is zero, and one is two omega. Well, that's the kind of phenomena we we've already we've already found. Okay. Okay. Inside the surface of infinite redshift, okay, there's frame dragging, and it's very efficient, I indeed. Okay, okay, everything is get getting pulled along with the uh, along with the rotation, okay, so that it has an omega which ranges from uh, uh, from zero to two omega. I mean, those are the two. Those are the two. Those are the two possibilities: zero or two omega. And we, and in the and in the the Kadam experiments we did we did in the in the past. We imagine the light ray shooting it in the direction of the rotation of the star, where, where it mo moved uh, 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 with, with twice omega, and then against the direction where it was stationary. Okay, okay, where it's stationary in the sense that that omega is equal to zero, omega minus is equal to zero. Okay, okay. Uh, now, if you do a little bit more arithmetic, okay, we can we will move down now. We won't, we won't solve this for gt equal, equal to zero, but now we're getting into a region where gtt is negative, okay? And we go move toward the, uh, the event horizon. If we go all the way to the event horizon, okay, then delta is equal to zero. That's how it's defined. That makes grr infinite, okay? We do a little bit of more arithmetic, and we'll find that omega squared is gtt over g phi phi, and that, in that case, uh, the, the, the two solutions coalesce to one solution, and that solution is just omega. So in that, so in that particular case, all observers on, uh, in circular orbits have a common uh, angular, uh, angular, angular velocity. Okay, so it's a little bit more arithmetic to be done in, in this case, and we're going to leave that to recitation because it's, it's, just, more, it's just more arithmetic. But it, it's showing us, it, it's just sh showing us how the how the frame dragging uh, occurs, okay, and that and that when you get down to the to the event horizon, everything is, is pulled relentlessly at at this uh, at this angular velocity, which in fact turns out to be the maximum angular velocity in the game. So we'll do that either in, in problem sets or in recitation in recitation section. There's a there's a little bit more arithmetic I have to plug in uh, to make explicit the, the current metric. I can't deal in these generic terms. And I'd rather do that kind of arithmetic uh, in, in a recitation section, not, not in, the, in the lecture. But I think the lecture here shows us shows us a lot of the a lot of the ingredients uh, of the of the of the solution, and then we work through the, the precise numbers in uh, in in our in our applications. So here, uh, other features of the curved black hole: well, they can interact with their environments, and they can exchange energy and angular momentum. Particles can leave and enter through the, the surface of an redshift. Okay, the light cones are not are not swept over from, from one side. This is not an event horizon. Okay, uh, okay, particles can can uh, come in and, uh, and 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 leave. Okay, um, so that makes the possibility that interesting things can happen in the ergosphere. The, you know, the frame dragging is intense in the ergosphere. So if I if I have a bunch of particles coming in. To it, they'll be they'll be they'll be uh, dragged around with the with the star, okay. Uh, if those particles are interacting electromagnetically or, or however, they'll start ex exchanging energy. They'll start flowing, okay. In in the in in the in the context of of a star which is sweeping them around, there's gonna they're gonna gen generate turbulence. It's gonna generate interactions between them if some of them carry charge. They're gonna start radiating, okay. Okay, so electromagnetic energy will radiate out of the ergosphere. Angular momentum will be carried by the by the electromagnetic wave, and angular momentum will be radiated out. Okay, and so those are the phenomena that, uh, that the astrophysicists uh, study and understand and understand very well. And I'm si and I'm simply uh, stating that here. Now, when you get down to the numbers again, you can find uh, you you can find high, uh, very high, uh, efficient conversion of relativistic kinetic energy to radiation occurs. 
right? The, the quantum field is being drawn into the, in, toward the black hole, okay? They're being swept around in it. They're, they're, they're deeply bound. They're deeply bound by the time they get near the, near the event horizon. How much so? Well, when they radiate, they can radiate at an efficiency of about 30%. That is, that is 30 percent of their rest mass can show up as as radiation. So it's a very deep binding, okay? Very spectacular uh, effects. These these black holes uh, can can radiate like mad, and their uh, their accretion disks, the, the material that's that's falling into them, that's grinding away in the uh, in the ergosphere, can put out a tremendous amount of light. Okay, so. Uh, Okay, efficiency is about is about thirty percent. You know that you might compare that to a nuclear bomb, where, where the conversion of mass to energy is just a fraction of one percent. Okay, this beats it by by a good deal. Okay, um, okay, and uh, it's very much reliant on the fact that it's a rotating black hole. If it's not rotating, it's not nearly as efficient. But still, you can get efficiencies of a few percent in in the case of uh, if you study Schwarzschild. shield. Uh, orbits in more, in more numerical detail. Of course, from the perspective of uh, high-energy physicists, this ain't no, no great, great big deal because our, our basic uh, colliders are 100% efficient, right? We take particles and antiparticles and pound them together. So all of that mass shows up as radiation, okay? So we beat them. We, uh, oh, we do 100% in, uh, in, in, uh, in our colliders, okay? But still, a naturally occurring conversion efficiency like that is really something rather magnificent. Okay, and so uh, in the in supplementary election, uh, uh, lecture 11, you should be flipping through it, you'll come to a great picture. You'll get to a picture of, of a black hole. That is, you know, you'll find the picture that was made by the Event Horizon Telescope uh, just, uh, just a year ago, okay, in which they get enough data to actually reconstruct the, uh, uh, a picture, okay, a, a luminous picture of a, a supermassive uh, black hole, which is which is rotating around, grinding, and its ergosphere is generating tremendous amounts of radiation. Okay, and so and so you can see a black hole, right? You see it because it's spinning, and the ergosphere and the material in it, of course, radiate like mad. So it, it sounds funny. What's a picture of a black hole? Well. You, you see the rim of the, of the ergosphere shining like the Dickens, and then inside it, you see blackness. Okay, and so take a look at the picture in the, in, in the, in, in the, uh, in the lecture, and uh, I also give you a, a link to the, to the web page, and everyone should take a look at that. And, you know, as time goes by, those pictures are going to get better, and uh, more pictures will be taken, and it's, it'll be great fun for you guys. Okay, well, let's keep going. That's all I want to say about rotating black holes. We're doing another special topic now. We're going to imagine Newton's granddaughter in orbit around a Schwarzschild black hole. Okay, we wanted there were a couple of still puzzles with our old pedantic uh, Schwarzschild black hole that we want to uh, well, that we want to understand. You know, throughout this lecture series, we've imagined the spaceships maintaining a fixed position outside a black hole. Is that a practical thing to do? Can you really can you really do that? What kind of thrust is required? So let's, uh, so let's imagine that we're, we live deep in the future and starships are, are very capable, and we have a starship captain who happens to be a great, 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 great uh, granddaughter of Newton, and, uh, and she's in control of this starship, and she's going to hold the, hold the, uh, the starship at a, at, a given, at a given R, theta, and phi. Okay. Well, she likes to think in terms of, of, uh, of forces because uh, that's just her heritage from Isaac Newton. And so she knows that the, uh, that the force of the radial direction is G, capital M, little m. Little m is the mass of the starship divided by R squared. And that will hold the ship at a fixed R. Okay, we'll verify that in a minute. Okay, so, so you see, I mean, the, 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 in, the, in the language of Newton, the, the mass is drawing this, this, the starship in. To, to, keep, to keep the starship at a constant distance away, it has to, it has to develop a thrust okay, in the negative radial direction, okay, and then it can maintain its position. Okay. Now, we, we want to think about that, of course, from the perspective of general relativity. In the perspective of general relativity, uh, there are no forces at all. We're in a force-free uh, environment. Okay. 
but what we have to deal with is curved space time so that the so that the thrust that the starship provides is uh, is uh, countering a virtual or apparent force okay which is generated by the curvature of space time and is encapsulated in our uh, Christoffel symbols and our uh, and our uh, uh, Riemannian uh, metric. Okay, so let's so let's dig that out. Okay, okay. So so uh, so she wants to know what what the force is, and she, and but and she wants to do experiments in her starship. So she wants to do experiments relative to an orthonormal uh, coordinate system. You know, just do an orthonormal coordinate system here. You know, uh, so you just you'll lay down x, y, and z, and then you'll just want uh, want to want those uh, 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 those uh, distances to be properly normalized, you'll want your, uh, your unit vectors to be properly normalized. Okay, okay. So, so for example, if, if we took her, her uh, basis vectors in the R direction in the, in the Schwarzschild uh, coordinate system, we would just say, okay, that they're 0, 1, 0, 0, right? Nothing in the time direction, 1 in the R direction, 0 in the theta direction, 0 in the phi direction. And I take the dot product of the two, Okay, and what do I get in my space time? Well, I get G11. Okay, that's the definition of, the, of that piece of the metric. And G11 for Schwarzschild is, is, is of course, the uh, singular uh, piece of, uh, of the metric, 1 over uh, Schwarzschild radius divided by the radius. Okay, so, so that, so, uh, you know, and that's a coordinate system I've been using for all of these things like F sub R. But, that's, but that, you see, is not properly normalized. Okay, so it's fine to use that uh, co that uh, dot product and everything. We've been doing it. It's perfectly fine. It's very sensible. Okay, okay. But you might you might come along and say, no, I would rather measure my measure my force relative to an uh, orthonormal basis. Well, it's trivial to make an orthonormal basis here. Just uh, uh, just take uh, just take uh, e sub r and divide by the norm. Well, the norm is just the square root of this. So I just divide through by one over the square root of g one one. And I have an orthonormal basis, and I've got it in the in the in the radial direction. Okay, but that means that, that now I want to I want to project my, my force in that particular in that particular direction. My force in the in the original Schwarzschild uh, coordinate system in the radial direction was given by f, f sub r. Now my my normalized uh, unit vector uh, has a division by a square root of g11. So to get the same physics in this other in this other coordinate system, my, my radial force in the normalized uh, uh, basis vector will just have to have the, G, uh, the square root of G11 upstairs counter that one. Okay, so this then is, is the force that uh, Mr. Newton would feel more comfortable with because it's the component of, of the force in a orthonormal uh, orth normal, uh, 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 basis. Okay, and what is that? Well, I just take the square root of this and I just take that. Okay, so I see that for Mr. Newton, uh, the, uh, the force actually at the event horizon uh, diverges. I come in from, from far away, and, I, and my, and my uh, starship has to provide a force which, which goes to infinity as I get ever so closer to the Schwarzschild radius. Okay. And that's and that's and that's the and that's the situation in in that particular in that particular uh, coordinate system. Okay. Now now you, you recall that, that that's special for this particular coordinate system. We're sitting at a fixed r, okay, and we're normalizing our, our coordinates appropriately. We recall that we, we dropped uh, 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 Mrs. Uh, uh, Newton and her starship through the uh, through the. Uh, the Schwarzschild uh, radius before, and uh, and she survived, and she and she went on down in in uh, through the uh, uh, through the event horizon down to r e equals zero, and in a finite amount of time on her on her watch on in her pro in her proper time, so that uh, uh, she never felt a divergent force like that, okay, because of course she was she was uh, a free fall, she wasn't being held at a constant r, okay, that el eliminates the singularity. The geometric factor shows the required thrust becomes arbitrarily large. Okay, so that so so that's interesting and uh, very relevant to uh, construction of starships. But now, uh, how did the captain know that F sub r was correct in the Schwarzschild coordinates? 
Okay, well, she knows how to write down F equals MA. That's all. Okay, so she writes down F equals MA, but of course, she knows general rel relativity, and she knows that the relativistic uh, form for A, okay, is, uh, is corrected by the curvature of space-time. Okay, so, so, in, so, so on the right-hand side of F equals MA, uh, it, it is it is it is MA, but it's but it's but it's A of a covariant variety, and uh, and, and and we've ca we calculated uh, before, okay, that uh, that the, uh, the the covariant uh, 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 differentiation of the of the uh, uh, of the velocity vector with, with respect to with respect to, to tau is given is given by two terms, one the naive the naive looking de derivative and then a correction, okay, because the uh, uh, the uh, space time is curved. Well, or, or because the 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 um, coordinates you're using are curvilinear or, or what have you. There's some there's some correction, okay, which are, which is of, the, of this of this particular variety, and, the, and then Christoffel sim symbols in, uh, contain. Uh, Okay, the curvature of space-time information and th the particular coordinate system that, that you use. Remember, Christoffel symbols depend upon the particular coordinate system you use. They're not in themselves, in, in themselves tensors. They're just uh, they're just indexed objects where we where we keep straight the uh, uh, the coordination that we're that we're using. So that that's what she writes down. Okay, but now she wants to apply it to her situation. Her ship's forward velocity is just is just uh, give, given by this, okay. But the ship is stationary, okay. That's by definition. She's she set f in such a way that it's going to stay stationary. So u dot u is just g zero zero u zero u zero. That's equal to c squared, okay. And then I know from my Schwarzschild uh, metric that g zero zero is equal to this. It's the one that goes to zero at the at the uh, uh, at the event horizon. And so I see that u naught is just one over the, the square root of that. Okay. Okay. So then we can get we can get uh, F R from from this equation. Okay. Because we're holding the spaceship fixed. So this derivative, of course, is, is equal to zero. The spaceship is not moving as a function of proper time. Okay. And what do I have over here? It's not moving. So the only components I get, which are non-zero, are alpha and beta equals zero. Okay. So u zero u zero is, is there. So I write that in, I write that in, u0, u0, I get two of these. Okay, and then I look back at, at our exercise in developing the Schwarzschild uh, uh, metric, and uh, okay, and I, uh, okay, and, and I confirm that, that the Schwarzschild, that the Christoffel symbol is this times, times this. Okay, and so in fact, f sub r, just putting it in, the Christoffel symbol is this times this. I see that my, my singular parts disappear. And lo and behold, I get what uh, what uh, the granddaughter of Isaac Newton knew from her starship uh, uh, education. Okay, so when so when the ship is stationary, its engine thrust is balanced by the force of the curvature of space time. Right. Well, we see that right. This term is gone. Okay, and the force is countered by by, by the bits that come from the curvilinear uh, uh, coordination, which encapsulate the uh, you know the curvature of space time through through the gammas and uh, and here's and here's the and here's the result the result of course being something uh, 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 familiar looking but requiring uh, a derivation uh, and which uh, we, and, and here's one now you can think of easier derivations for this but I wanted to but I wanted to illustrate this this line of thought okay uh, because again I wanted we wanted to see again explicitly that it's the it's, it's these second terms, okay, which bring in the force of the quote force of gravity in 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 these uh, in, in these situations. So I think that's interesting, and uh, there are lots of applications for these uh, for these ideas. And it's fun to be able to write down f equals m a in any old coordinate system in a completely in a completely uh, general relativistically invariant uh, invariant fashion, and, and do some do some. Uh, Okay, so that's all it will. That's all it will. will do with this, and uh, next time we'll go on and and, and and also flesh out a topic that we've uh, discussed a little bit. We've discussed the uh, conservation laws, and now let's uh, 
let's put some meat on that and introduce you to some of the terminology of conservation laws uh, and symmetries in uh, general relativity. 